now. Welcome to the Canadian Association of the Club of Rome Zoom presentation series. My name is Rick Carpenter. And as today's host, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rosalind Warner, continuing college professor at Okanagan College in British Columbia. Rosalind's topic is the post-Anthropocene. With some three decades teaching, research, and publishing experience, as well as a considerable current involvement with a number of governance and environmental organizations, she brings a wealth of acumen to bear on this intriguing topic. Following the presentation, I'll put questions from the audience to Dr. Warner in the order that they appear in the Zoom chat function. Rosalind, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's, uh, uh, I'd like to express my uh, appreciation to the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome for this opportunity. And um, in keeping with your um, Indigenous acknowledgement there, I would also say that I'm coming to you from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan people in Kelowna, BC. So there's a little bit of information about myself. I always love to have more Twitter followers. So feel free if you tweet, tweet at me. Um, and I also have a blog, uh, roswarner.com, where I talk a lot about similar kinds of issues that I'm gonna uh, speak about today. Um, you can always get in touch with me by email. I'm really interested in hearing what people think about the ideas that I'm gonna share today and looking forward to the discussion. I'm going to cover basically four main sections, um, kind of moving chronologically through the ancient past up until today and taking apart this notion of the Anthropocene, thinking a little bit about how humans have thought about changes in the Earth system over the course of millennia. Bring it back up to today and think about how our present day situation is changing the way that we think about the human nature relationship. And then I'm going to do something that political scientists almost never like to do, which is to cast forward and to consider, given the situation that we're in today, how do we think about the human nature relationship? So it's um, sort of a tour, if you will, through human history, through natural history, and a look forward. Where are we going? And how do we think about where we're going? So I'm hoping that there'll be some new ideas here. Um, some of it might be really familiar to you, but some of it might not be, and some of it might be uh, just a different way of looking at familiar information. So first of all, ancient catastrophes. Um, one thing that I recently learned about was the discoveries of archeologists were that there was an explosion of cave art about 42,000 years ago. And the art that they saw, for example, the, um, the, artists, the artists included animals, they included um, you know, situations and, and human beings hunting and they could never quite figure out, number one, why the artwork was so high up in the cave. So it was like basically at the top of the cave. And the question would be, why go through all the energy and time of putting your artwork so high up and so far away from where people could see it? So this was really a mystery up until they decided to, to simulate the actual cave conditions of the time, which would have been Using, using torches, of course. So, so when, you, when you actually walk into the cave with a torch, you see something really different in the artwork. It starts to move. So the animals, uh, you, it's almost like a cinema effect that you get. And having them high up very much gave the sense of watching a movie. Right, So this kind of proto-cinema effect was something new. People hadn't really thought about why that was happening or why people were thinking about the natural environment in that way. Interestingly, along with these more recent discoveries about how and why 
humans moved into the caves 42,000 years ago, they started to line this up with what was going on with the climate, what was going on with the solar cycles and other aspects of the, of the uh, natural environment. And what they realized was that the world had actually experienced a few centuries of really apocalyptic conditions 42,000 years ago. Triggered by a reversal of the Earth's magnetic poles, combined with changes in the sun's behavior, these conditions would have created dazzling light shows of the aurora across the world. At times, nights would be seen as bright as daytime. And these dramatic changes also would have produced unprecedentedly high UV levels, which probably what, which is what caused humans to try to seek shelter in these caves and leading to the sudden explosion of cave art. So, so the, the breakdown in the ozone, the increase in the aurora, probably would have seemed like the end of days. It was a little bit like the plot of a horror movie. So the ozone layer was destroyed. Electrical storms would have been raging across the tropics. Solar winds are generating these spectacular light shows. Arctic air poured across North America, the ice sheets and the glaciers surged, and weather patterns shifted violently. People would have been exposed to intense ultraviolet light, and the Neanderthals and the giant animals known as megafauna started to go extinct. While humans sought protection in their caves. For reasons that's not entirely clear, magnetic pole movements do happen periodically throughout the Earth's history. They often can wobble, but sometimes they can take an extreme change in and, and basically flip. Um, one of the most dramatic of these pole migrations took place at exactly this time, 42,000 years ago, and is known as the Le Champs excursion. This is named after the village where it was discovered in the French Massif Central. Up until now, it hasn't been clear that magnetic changes actually had any impacts on climate or on life on the planet. So these things are starting to come together in a way where we're, we're beginning to understand exactly what happened 42,000 years ago. Um, because of the coincidence of seemingly random cosmic events and the extreme environmental changes, um, this is sometimes called the Adams event a tribute to the great science fiction writer, Douglas Adams, who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And those of you who are familiar with this will know the importance of the, of the uh, number 42 because it is, of course, the answer to life, the universe and everything. So Douglas Adams was really onto something with this number 42. And the question is, how did he know? <laughs> so how did he know? that the number 42 would be so um, important in human and natural history. Uh, moving ahead a little bit, we can talk about the worst year to be alive. So that would be 536, if you, in case you're wondering. In 536, a dark fog blocked the sun for about 18 months, caused a two year long winter, a worldwide famine, and a plague that wiped out half the global population. Uh, so basically it was the worst year to be alive. Um, Icelandic volcano exploded, darkness descended over the Northern hemisphere, uh, created this fog of darkness for approximately 18 months, um, plunging the Middle East, Europe and parts of Asia where day and night would essentially be dark continuously and um, crops failed. There was also a plague at the same time, the plague of Justinian, which wiped out a significant portion of the population. Um, as it was said by the Byzantine historian Procopius, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness like the moon during the whole year. Temperatures in the summer of 536 fell between 1.5 and 2.5 degrees Celsius, initiating the coldest decade in the past 2300 years. The Irish Chronicles record a failure of bread from the years 536 to 539. 
Then, of course, as we know, the bubonic plague and the plague of Justinian struck the Roman port of Pelusium in Egypt. Spreading rapidly, it wiped out about one third to one half of the population of the Eastern Roman Empire and hastened its collapse. So looking back at these historical disasters, one would be, uh, one would be inclined to say that, number one, nature has not been very kind to humans. Nature has not been very kind to other species as well. Um, in fact, there's, there have been many, many extinction events, and as is famously well known, almost all the species on Earth at one point have gone extinct. So extinction is quite, uh, but we can identify uh, five in the last five million years. And um, so what we're talking about when we talk about a mass extinction event is when Earth has really had to recover from something that's very short lived and very uh, wide ranging in the number of species that are being affected. The five major mass extinction events that we've seen in the last five million years have been caused by various causes, uh, mostly um, climate change associated with the kinds of incidents that I talked about in the uh, Lashams excursion. But also geophysical changes, volcanic activity has been particularly important. Um, these cat catastrophic blows have been caused by ocean acidification, uh, toxic metal poisoning, asteroid bombardment, acid rain, ozone damage, and the increased UV rad radiation, cooling and photosynthesis shut down, and all of these things have been implicated in different numerous events. To give you another um, example, about 70,000 years ago, a volcano called Toba erupted on Sumatra in Indonesia, as it's known today. It blew roughly 650 miles of vaporized rock into the air. It's the largest volcanic eruption we know of, and it almost wiped out humans completely. We went down to around between 1,000 and 10,000 individuals in the population. And that is about the, the lowest that we believe humans have ever been. So extinctions in the past have been periodic. Uh, we can point to orbital changes. We can point to gamma ray bursts. We can point to the position of the solar system and even our position in the universe. In fact, we are in a kind of a charmed position in the universe in where our galaxy is right now. And we can almost talk about a, a, a Goldilocks um, you know, position for the Earth. We're, we've been relatively safe from gamma ray bursts, uh, which, which are basically sterilization events, which can wipe out life uh, completely. Gravitational changes have played their role early in the in the Earth's history. Of course, the moon was much closer. The days were much shorter during the time of the dinosaurs. So those have been ongoing changes. Changes in the sun, changes in the moon. The sun goes through 11 year solar cycles and at times when it's much quieter or and times when it's much more active. We also happen to be beside a pretty friendly sun. Um, most of the stars in the universe are actually red dwarfs, and they're uh, much more damaging to their neighboring planets than our sun is. So uh, the minority of, of stars in the universe are actually friendly to the kind of life that we're familiar with here. So we can point to a lot of different things which have enabled the, um, the Earth, the planet, the solar system to evolve in the way it has. We're now discovering that actually there are there is a Goldilocks zone in a galaxy where if our solar system was located anywhere else in the galaxy, we likely would not, uh, humans would not have come to be and the earth would not have come to be the kind of uh, support for life that it is. Um, so this idea is known as the finely tuned universe, one which seems, it almost seems as if things are lined up in a very, very dangerous and hostile universe things seem to line up perfectly to allow for human consciousness 
and human civilizations to develop. At the same time, we know that there are many, many, many more hazards out there than we even were aware of uh, it, from the ancient time up until today. So um, one of the questions that this prompts for, for me in my thinking is how would ancient peoples have viewed nature under these circumstances? And I am not in any way going to you know, try to speak for anthropologists and archeologists who do this stuff on a regular basis and might have a better answer to this than I do. Uh, but this, so there's a little bit of speculation here, like given, given this, given what we know about how people lived, how would they have viewed nature? Well, um, I think it's fair to say that for most of human history, nature has been pretty mysterious. We actually don't always have clear, obvious answers for why things happen the way they do. We, we don't know why the earth, uh, Every, every once in a while decides to shift the magnetic pole. Like, uh, we can predict orbital changes, um, but there's beyond the solar system, there's very, very little that we can predict. We can't predict solar uh, gamma ray bursts or anything like that. So a lot of it is still really mysterious. And I think to ancient people, it would have been very mysterious. I think when you look at the kinds of paintings, the kinds of imagery that early people produced, it's fair to say that they had an affinity for nature. And we know that uh, many indigenous people around the world today identify nature as a, as a relative, as part of human society, or see nature and humans as being co-created. So nature as kin, I think, of, of, of having a close affinity with humans um, kind of stands in opposition to the idea that the, the universe is hostile, but at the same time, it's a very deep-seated idea in human history and in human culture that we do have a strong relationship with nature, that nature is like a member of our family. And as I say, looking at the absolutely beautiful experiences that people wanted to recreate in the caves, it suggests that they did have an affinity for nature and even a fondness for nature, recognizing, of course, that they are dependent on, on those animals and on nature for survival. And thirdly, how would they have imagined the relationship between human and non-human worlds? Um, well, again, what we see is a, the stro a strong thread throughout human culture and human history of seeing a relationship between the two. So seeing, seeing maybe not even considering that they are separate worlds, but thinking of them as being part of a common planetary society in a way. So um, let's bring it up a little bit towards the Anthropocene and how we are thinking about that today. The, uh, the Anthropocene, um, some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, basically, it just refers to the idea that uh, we have entered an era in which humans are a strong uh, geological force, a dominant geological force. So where in the past we would have said that the earth system has been affected by astronomical and geophysical changes, in the last six decades, we start to talk about anthropogenic forcing, that we're seeing a rapid increase in changes, uh, rapid changes in the earth system, and that humans are now affecting the planet in a way that we really didn't have any uh, awareness of before. Just to give you a couple of examples, since 1950, the human enterprise has experienced a remarkable explosion, the great acceleration. Whatever unfolds, the next few decades will surely be a tipping point moving towards the evolution of the Anthropocene. So from 1950, we saw concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of around 310 parts per million. The, the latest reading that we have is 420 parts per million. Note that this is the highest level of carbon dioxide, not just in recorded history, not just since the invention of agriculture, since the beginning of the Holocene about 12,000 years ago, 
But since before modern humans existed, so millions of years ago, in many ways now then, the climate is anthropogenic in a way that we really couldn't imagine before. So this is a measure of uh, going back to the end of the last ice age, which is where we usually point to the beginning of the Holocene. The Holocene epoch is uh, the period since the last warming, the end of the ice age. It's the period, of course, when agriculture has been developed. It's a period when we have all of recorded history it's a period when we have had also the most stable climate window of the past 650,000 years. And um, if we were, if the earth were to follow the same pattern, the same cycle of, of development of the climate, then we would likely start to see another cooling, but not for about another 40,000 years. So the Holocene is part of this cycle, controlled partly by the shape of the Earth's orbit. The warm period of the Holocene, which started at the end of the last ice age, should likely continue for about another 40,000 years. Of course, barring some kind of uh, volcanic, volcanic event or an asteroid or something along those lines. So if nature would have its way, the Earth would slip back again into the grips of another major ice age in about 40,000 years and frigid landscapes would once again expand outward from the poles. So we have been, we've been shielded from the climate's violence by our short civilizational memory, and uh, fair to say, some remarkably good fortune. Remarkably good window, very narrow window in which we have been able to grow and thrive into a conscious civilization. When you start to see how severely we have departed from this regular cycle, this is where we are now in terms of global mean temperature. In a very short period of time, we have clearly moved in a way that we have not seen before. <laughs> So looking at this, is, this is a 12,000 years ago, if you zoom in and look at only since the year 2000, and we look at the close up, we see that we really are quite off the charts in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide that is being put into the atmosphere. So we're undergoing this kind of ongoing chemistry experiment. And we know that we've existed within these rather slim climatic parameters. And we also know that what we are, what we are experiencing now is likely to push us outside of the bounds of the Holocene and into the Anthropocene. So what does that look like? Um, we can also point to lots of parallel ways in which we're changing land use, all of the things that are contributing to carbon dioxide emissions, methane emissions, and other greenhouse gas emissions, everything from the amount of waste we produce to the changes in land use, the changes in agriculture, the way in which we are consuming energy, of course, is very important. The, the human stamp on the land, on the ocean, on the atmosphere is un, uh, un, unquestionable, I think, right? So the time interval in which we are living, the Anthropocene, seems to be one in which human activities now rival those global geophysical processes. We did not, humans did not evolve in the context of this climate. Um, for example, when there's been as much carbon dioxide in the air as there already is today, the world has been much, much warmer. We saw seas of 70 feet higher than they are today. During the Pliocene epoch, three million years ago, when global temperatures were two to three degrees Celsius warmer than today, carbon dioxide levels were believed to have topped out between 310 and 400 parts per million. So in the past, when we have seen these kinds of changes, we have seen a radically different planet. It's worth asking, 
you know, cave paintings have survived 42,000 years. What, what will survive in 42,000 years of our civilization today? What would we leave behind? We could point to the incredible amounts of plastic, which now are, are rivaling the volume of fish in the ocean. We could point to um, you know, the atmospheric changes. We could point to changes in land use and a lot of different things. But it's kind of interesting to ask that question. You know, what If we are in the Anthropocene, what does that mean? What would that look like to future generations? I think it's fair to say that one thing we know we would leave behind would be a lot of nuclear waste. So we do know that nuclear waste has this, has a very, very long half-life. Um, and so uh, scientists and the best minds in the planet have tried to think of a way to communicating to future generations um, the nature of that nuclear waste. And this is this, these are some of their attempts. So this first one uh, is a plaque and it says, the, this place is not a place of honor. You know, assuming anthropologists, assuming that wherever a, pla a place is marked, then it might suggest that, that there's, uh, there's something sacred there. This place is not a place of honor. No highly esteemed deed is commemorated here. Nothing valued is here. What is here is dangerous and repulsive to us. This message is a warning about danger. I mean, it's an interesting problem. How do you communicate the nature of the da danger to people who are as different, who may be as different from us today as we are to those who lived 42,000 years ago? Here's some other examples. Um, so use the face. So people, are, we know that we're predisposed to see faces and to understand faces and expressions. It could be different in 42,000 years, we might have different ways of looking at it. And we can, or we could have stick drawings, right? We could have uh, somebody, here's a stick person um, standing beside a big hole and there's like some industrial equipment and you can see the, the uh, nuclear symbol. Um, so the nuclear symbol would presumably be put onto the nuclear waste to show that that's what they're talking about. And then you have the, the nuclear radiation coming up and the, and the stick figures are dying. Okay, that might work. <laughs> so you're telling a little story, maybe it's a storyboard, people would be able to understand that. But again, think back to those cave paintings, like do we really know the meaning of those cave paintings 42,000 years ago? And what kind of sense would, would people of the future make of that? Um, danger, poisonous radioactive waste is here. I think you'd have to have a bit of context to understand what radioactive waste means or, or what it means, why we're not digging or drilling. So it's an interesting question. If we really stop to think about the Anthropocene, we have to think about the impact of humans far, far into the future. Now, depending on how far we go, I think it's fair to say that, that humans would just be disappeared. Um, there would be no, literally no evidence. And there's some scientists who speculate that actually we might've even had, um, we might've even had civilizations in the past who grew up and then have disappeared and we have no sign of them because of the churning of the earth's uh, tectonic plates. So that kind of brings me up to where we are today. What about present day catastrophes? How do they fit into this? So for, we know that 42,000 years ago, we know that we've had this series of extinctions. Um, what does that mean for us today? Well, I live in British Columbia and I think a lot of British Columbians have been feeling the heat to say the least and realizing um, that there are some changes that we might have to anticipate that are gonna be outside of our experience. So the heat dome in late June last year uh, killed 595, I think it's over 600 now, um, British Columbians who died. The heat dome was extremely unlikely. It was, very, it was an event very much outside of the norm and it was very much outside of what we might predict for this part of the world. Myself, I live right beside a creek here in the city of Kelowna and we, in 2017, we experienced flooding. Um, now, 
those of us who know the history of our valley would recognize that actually Kelowna, the whole city is built on a floodplain actually. And you know, over the years it's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, but uh, the potential for flooding was always there. Uh, fires, we also know, I mean, we're, we now talk about fire season. That's a new thing. We never really used to have that problem back in the day when I was a, a and I was a kid, I used to come up here for summer holidays and we, we would never even consider or imagine that we would have the kinds of fires that we're having now. Mudslides and flooding, um, they go together. So, so deforestation brings mudslides and flooding, fires uh, kill the trees that hold the ground together and then the mudslides follow. The flooding is a function of the snowpack in a given year, followed by how much of a heat wave you actually have. So um, we're looking at a really, really different kind of environment. We're looking at something that maybe ancient peoples might have been looking at as well, which is major changes to the climate and major changes to the way in which we are living in our civilization. Um, some people, sometimes people talk about the atmospheric river in November as well as, as sort of following on the summer of forest fires. And the flow to Okanagan Lake in May was about, last year was about 240% of normal and 10% higher than any other year. So we're breaking records uh, really all over the place. Some of the changes emerging across the climate system are, are related to climate, but they're, they're like signs, they're like signals that the earth is giving us. Obviously carbon dioxide increasing. Um, this also shows key moments in the history of climate science, the invention of the efficient steam engine by James Watt in 1790. Sometimes people identify that as the year the Anthropocene started. There's a lot of debate about when it actually started um, and I, I'm actually not sure that we'll ever come up with an answer to that, <laughs> but it does seem to be something different is going on. Um, John Tyndall identified the primary greenhouse gases as early as 1861. The first estimate of climate sensitivity by Svante Arrhenius in 1896, and the discovery that the world was warming by Guy Calendar in 1938. Uh, and then really didn't reach the popular imagination until the 1970s, the 1980s, very much made more heightened by the energy crisis of the 1970s. But what I like about this particular slide is that it shows the relationship between all of these different effects. So the fact that the cherry blossoms are coming earlier in Kyoto every year that humidity over land is increasing up 4% since the 1970s. Uh, sea level rise, 22 centimeters since around 1900. And of course, troposphere warming and ocean warming. One of the things that scientists have identified is that the big change that we are, we are anticipating now is not the change in the release of greenhouse gases, but the fundamental change in the ability of the earth to absorb uh, heat, particularly the ocean. The ocean is going to be the, the, the biggest determinant of where we are in terms of our, tipping, our climate tipping points. The planetary boundaries literature uh, came upon the field in 2009, introduced a series of measures with the idea that we needed to identify what the safe operating space for humanity might actually be. So we, uh, many scientists started to look at um, the relationship between different effects that humans were having on the planet and to try to identify uh, the boundaries. What, what can the planet absorb? What can the planet um, uh, deal with? What can it adapt to? And what is the range in which humans can operate safely? So that includes uh, climate change. The, the original publication in 2009 had six planetary boundaries. It's now been expanded to nine. 
things like stratospheric ozone depletion, the thing that was a big concern 42,000 years ago. The loss of biosphere integrity, and that includes not just loss of species, but also genetic biodiversity and ecosystem biodiversity. Uh, chemical pollution and the release of novel entities. So novel entities might include things like hormone disruptors and drugs and things in the atmosphere, or microplastics. Climate change, of course, ocean acidification, the release of nitrogen fertilizers, which is causing large dead zones in the ocean. Um, and of course, land system change and changes to fresh water, both green, green water is the water usable by plants and blue water is the, the water usable by humans. So this is the latest uh, version of this idea of planetary boundaries. And um, you can see that some of the most worrying are changes in biogeochemical flows. So changes in the nitrogen cycle. So for for, for many, many decades now, we have been dumping nitrogen onto our agricultural lands to make them more fit, to more to make them more productive. But at the same time, that nitrogen is being flushed down into our into our fresh water, into our oceans, and it's really causing havoc with those um, ecosystems. Um, on the on the right hand side, you can see a really good summary of what the risks might look like. Uh, things like extreme weather. We know that weather is becoming more extreme. We know that it's it, there's difference over whether it's more frequent, but um, storms are slower, they're heavier. Changes to species, uh, particularly insects, are concerning. Um, the the particular drop, not just honeybees, but the drop in the number of insects that we see, uh, many of which are pollinators, is concerning. Um, the Arctic sea ice loss, sea level rise, coral bleaching, and it also brings in the costs in terms of food and water pr provision, as well as cost to economic growth. And I think we saw that, we experienced that in BC this last year, where for the first time, I think we really realized how costly recovery from these, these disasters can be. So that brings us to this question of tipping points. So the big, the big concern now, it, given our situation, is how far can we go without natural processes taking over? So what are the points at which we see a rapid acceleration of change and the move to a new equilibrium? Um, so we're looking at uh, coral reefs. We're looking at um, outsized events like the heat dome in Western Canada. We're looking at the West Antarctic ice sheet and the potential for a tipping event there. And we're looking at things like the ocean circulation and as well as the increase in summer temperatures, which you can see uh, the, the, the drought in the United States West is particularly concerning given the heavy dependence on water in that area. And um, so there's a sense now that what are, it, the concern now is obviously the behavior of human civilization, but also whether or not earth can actually absorb the outsized effects of that human civilization is open to question. There are still a lot of question marks here. Nobody can pinpoint exactly when these tipping points might be reached, but we do know that we're looking at systems. Systems are complex and complicated. They can reach thresholds. And once they reach those thresholds, they can undergo rapid change to a new kind of equilibrium or a new kind of state. Just to give you another example, this is the, the 2022 measurements of daily average temperatures at Concordia Station in Antarctica. Again, really, really extreme off the chart kinds of changes that we're seeing in 2022. This is the kind of thing that we would expect to see when we're approaching Earth's boundary, its limit, the limit of the Earth's ability to absorb the anthropogenic uh, influences. 
And again, just to reiterate the ways in which carbon dioxide emissions are very, very far off uh, what, we, what the earth has experienced over the previous two deglaciations. So we have tipping points. We have multiple ecological changes. We have species extinction rates. Um, we estimate now that the, the, the species extinction rate is 1000 times larger than the background species extinction rate that we've experienced for the last 12,000 years. Um, one of those key planetary boundaries is that decline in biodiversity. And again, we don't 100% know what the tipping point might be for that decline in biodiversity. And at what point does the change in the reduction of biodiversity start to actually affect ecosystem services? In other words, the ability of the ecosystem to support humans. So that brings me back to my question. Given all that we know now and the development of science and the development of our knowledge of our planetary history, how would modern people uh, view nature under these circumstances? Well, let's look back at the original categories that I had, um, mysterious nature. Really modern people have made nature quite quite not mysterious, or shall I say, it doesn't mean that we've necessarily learned how nature works any more than we've understood how we work. We really uh, have so much more to learn about that. There's still a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of dark matter out there. There's a lot of uh, changes in the universe that we don't really understand. But our perception of how mysterious nature is has changed. We, we, uh, this is the, probably the first time in history where we've actually believed that we do understand nature. So we, we've taken the mystery out of it in a way that modern people have identified nature as something controllable, something manageable, something understandable, something that can be reduced and something that can be used for human needs. This is kind of an, a very unusual view in the history of human cultures because it's actually a minority view. I mean, most human cultures in history have not seen nature in this way. And it's also a minority view today, even, even today. Um, many, many people around the world um, are much more open to the idea that nature is mysterious and, and not understandable. Modern people have moved away from that and they they've now believe, and I think it's fair to say that our culture in North America and Europe and, and Western thinking is very much around the idea that we, we do understand nature, we do know how to control it, we do know how to understand it. Um, what about nature as kin or the, the idea that nature is something to be appreciated and loved and um, that we are part of it? Um, again, I think the modern mind has really moved away from that. And the idea, and we've brought it back in different ways, like the love of wilderness and the love of uh, you know, the belief in, in um, biophilia, for example. But at the same time, we don't really think of nature as kin. We don't see our co-equal. We don't see our, ourselves as co-evolving with nature. We really have um, viewed nature as something outside of ourselves, something we're separate from, something we're distinct from, and something which we can, in some ways, control. And what about those human and non-human worlds? So I'm gonna put a question mark there and I'm gonna to add to it a little bit because when I ask myself, what does a modern person think about nature? Um, I have to add in a few more concepts like a complex adaptive system. Uh, so so the, the image that I have here is more like a fractal. Uh, so a fractal is basically the repetition of a particular pattern, a mathematical relationship that we see in nature over and over. So the way trees grow, the way rivers run, the, the, way, um, the way that systems operate is based on this complex adaptive idea. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about this. So a complex adaptive system, it has what we call emergent properties. So in other words, the, the features of the system are something more than the individual 
parts that make it up. So it's literally more than the sum of its parts. So the flight, the flight of a flock of birds can be triggered by the smallest change in one of the birds or even two of them, and it becomes something that is a feature of the flock itself and not of the birds. Same with a school of fish. So a school of fish can can respond to environmental changes in a way that is different from the way in which each individual fish might respond to it. Central to complex adaptive systems is the idea of cause and effect and the idea of feedback loops and flows. So something is a cause, it creates an effect. There are feedback loops, either positive or negative. We see a lot of this in the climate science and the discussion around tipping points. And flows, in, in the study of ecology, flows are key. Flow of energy through an, through, an, through an ecosystem is really what helps us understand that ecosystem as a whole. I really like this graphic because it shows, you know, yes, climate change is at the center, but look at all of the other aspects that we don't even usually think are connected, like mental health, like our, the opioid epidemic, real estate markets, the independence of the press, the strength of democratic norms, food supply, yes, but what about education? What about violence, including gun violence? What about national security or even the solvency of the insurance industry? Mass incarceration, racial equity. It's difficult for us to kind of get our minds around the fact that these things may actually be connected. All right, what about the future? Um, where are we going? What does it mean to think? What is what is our thinking about human and humans and nature evolving? What does it look like in terms of the next uh, set of challenges? Here, I want to move from archaeology and anthropology, uh, move and to move away from computer science because systems theory really comes from computer science, and I want to talk about physics. So, from 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 quantum physics we get the idea of entanglement. And entanglement is actually an extremely complex thing, but it is not necessarily what we might think of as a system. Entanglement is an emergent property, so it draws from systems theory a little bit. It's an emergent property of two distant particles that appear to share the same state without communicating. So there's an element of mystery here, um, as we know, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. The two particles are separate, but they're not distinct. They are, and they're also not connected in any way that we can identify. They're not necessarily connected in the way that we would think of cause and effect are connecting them. They're actually part one and the same. We actually have to think of the two particles as being one. That is, a, a, that is another step ahead in terms of systems thinking. Now, what does that mean for humans in nature? How do we think about humans in nature as being entangled? Well, I really like this, these words from uh, Stefan. The human enterprise is now a fully coupled interacting component of the Earth system itself. Okay, so that means uh, we need to, or, or I, I don't want to say we need to, but we, we may be thinking about nature now in a way that is returning to mis mystery. Um, what is the mystery of nature and what are the things that we don't really understand about it? And how humbling is it for us to think about nature as continuing to be mysterious? This is definitely a move away from the modern. It's definitely a move away from the Anthropocene, which tends to view human civilization as all powerful and all controlling. And it also moves us toward um, a sense of modesty, perhaps even humility about our relationship with nature. Nature as kin, and again, I think this does move us back to, if in fact we are nature and nature is us, what does that mean? It means that we are, we are two particles, but we are entangled, we are entwined. The future of the planet and the future of humans are one and the same. We are the same community, we are the same society. And so, uh, to think of nature as kin, I think, is much more appropriate to the situation that we find ourselves today. And again, not so much complex systems, but entangled and complex worlds. 
So we have one earth, but we have many worlds. We have many ways of understanding the world. We have many ways of looking at it and considering its operations. And we have many metaphors for understanding human and nature relationships. Are we tipping into a new system stasis? Are we looking at a new world that will be qualitatively and quantitatively different from the one we have known, not just in terms of the Holocene, but also in terms of the Anthropocene? We're actually moving beyond this, the, anthrop the Anthropocene idea that we are the source of all of these changes and we need to kind of embrace the idea of mystery of nature again and that we really know very little about the kind of world that we are creating for ourselves. We do know that business as usual cannot continue because business as usual is based on the assumption that we are still in that homeostasis. We are still in the Holocene, which is clearly not the case. What does it look like? Now, these are going... I'm, I'm a, a political scientist. I, I always ask myself, what does this mean for what, how do we live and what do we do about it? And so I'm going to work from the very abstract towards the more practical here. What does this mean? What does it mean to live in a post Anthropocene world? Um, I, I think it means adaptive management. So in other words, it means um, being aware of the intertwining of the human and natural worlds and recognizing that adaptation is needed. We're already seeing that movement in some governments that are looking at adaptation and systems planning. Attending to those planetary boundaries. They might, always, they might not always be exactly where they, we think they are, so we need to have some humility there. But we also need to recognize that growth is not on. Unlimited growth is no longer the paradigm that we can live with. Attend to multi-scale and multi-level risks. So I'm going to say a little bit more about risks in a minute. But living at multiple scales and recognizing that the local and the global and the planetary are connected, information has to be able to move quickly from the local to the global and back. We need to be able to exchange information and communication across our systems, from the economic system to the political system, to the health system, to the to the uh, scientific community. All these communities need to be coordinating together and making sure that the best possible information is available. Uh, again, like just to build on this, having these polycentric learning systems where societies can learn from each other and, and move towards more sustainable states based on the exchange that comes from that. And emulate natural processes. So similar to biomimicry, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same. There are things, there are processes in nature that we can identify that are more adaptive and some that are less adaptive. So it's not necessarily right or wrong, but it's about how do we arrive at a situation where we can emulate those natural processes to the best that we possibly can. I've done a fair bit of work on systemic risk reduction. And one of the things that we're learning, especially since COVID-19, is that there's actually a distinction between a hazard, a vulnerability, and an exposure to a risk. So a hazard is the forces and features that pose the challenges and problems. So for the ancient people 42,000 years ago, the hazard might have been radiation coming through the atmosphere. That's usually not something that we can necessarily control. We couldn't necessarily predict the heat dome. We wouldn't know exactly when it's going to happen. We can't predict the atmospheric rivers and the hurricanes. But um, so those are hazards. So those, rec those are represented as hazards. But we can learn more about them and we can, we can try to understand as best we can what are the forces working to produce those hazards. Vulnerability is um, a, a combination of the susceptibility to the hazard and, and the natural hazard itself. So for example, with, with COVID-19, a person's vulnerability and a society's vulnerability is based on things like how much, how many antibodies do we have in the population to recognize that virus? Um, how many 
people live on a floodplain that might be affected by future floods. That's a measure of vulnerability. Now, vulnerability is something that we have a little bit more control of. In the case of COVID-19, we were able to develop vaccines and reduce our vulnerability to that. Even though the hazard still exists and the hazard is still evolving and still developing out there and we still don't exactly know where it might pop up again or what new variant might emerge, we can reduce our vulnerability and we can also affect exposure. So we can, the exposure is the numbers and percentages of populations that are affected by a particular hazard. So reducing exposure means paying attention to inequities in society, making sure that the vulnerable are taken care of, making sure that the conditions for disease are not, um, are not running rampant within the hospital or within the household or within the population. So there are things we can control. And I think that the, the cave dwellers from 42,000 years ago uh, would, would be very envious, I would say, at the very least, very envious about how much we can actually do. I mean, they could do very little. They could do nothing against the kinds of hazards they were facing. We can do a lot. We have a, we can, we have a lot of ability to adapt and control our behavior, and we know how to do it. We have the technology, we have the know-how. It's just a question of changing our systems in such a way that we are considering our relationship with nature differently. The overarching view here is what I would call stewardship. So if the Anthropocene was about human dominance, the post-Anthropocene should be about stewardship, recognizing that we have a responsibility to the planet and that we are part of that. It means emulating nature in terms of our resource use and our transformation of waste. It means the transformation of our agricultural systems, our energy systems, our transport systems, our building systems, our systems of municipal planning. It means developing an effective architecture for governance of planetary stewardship to consider the incredible luck that we have had uh, in our place in the universe to think about polycentric and multi-level governance rather than centralized and hierarchical. So what have we learned in 42,000 years? I asked myself, what did we learn 42,000 years ago about nature and about the planet? And what was the result of that? How did we develop as humans? Well, one thing that anthropologists have been looking at is, is um, what we actually developed at that time. We developed language. We developed societies. We developed family groups. We started to develop agriculture. We started to settle in, in places once the worst of the crisis was over. We developed art. We developed technology. We became what we are today because of what happened 42,000 years ago. Can we think today, can we go back to the caves? And I don't mean li literally, I mean, go back to the experience of 42,000 years ago and develop ourselves, develop our society, focus on the human civilization, and our relationship with the planet and think about what we could learn from what we're about to face in the post-Anthropocene. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Should I stop screen sharing? Yes, you could do that. Um, okay. Thank you so much uh, for a fascinating tour of uh, of nature and uh, humanity's world. Um, I'm going to <clears throat> take some uh, questions now for you, Rosalind, and uh, I'm going to uh, start. Uh, 
with a question myself, but first what I'd like to do is just make sure that Peter McKinnon is on deck because yours will be the first question uh, in a what is right now a very short list. We've got um, uh, at least 28 minutes. We've got at least uh, 28 minutes now to uh, take questions. And uh, as I say, we've got two questions uh, coming up. Um, I would just like to ask uh, perhaps to clarify uh, the title, which is a very interesting one, the Post Anthropocene. And I'm wondering um, whether Rosalind, you have uh, thought about when that, what would mark the beginning of that period? Mm, yeah, good question. So I think that geog geologists like to have these like break points, perhaps. But one of the things that we realize is that the in geological terms, things happen super slowly. Wow. And for the Anthropocene to be happening this fast is, is just unprecedented. It's, it's not something that I don't think even geologists can answer. So the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> like when might this, would it be 2100? Would it be 2075? Um, there's just too many, too many unknowns to be able to say exactly when this might happen. Now I should say that political scientists use post in a different way. We use it kind of as a normative, um, a normative spur, I guess, to, to kind of push people to think differently about the terms that we use. So um, I, I guess one thing would be to say, if we think differently about the Anthropocene, we can start to think differently about what the post-Anthropocene might look like, if we can think of ourselves as moving beyond it. So it's more has more to do with our consciousness and our, our psychology of, of where we're at now. It may be that in 42,000 years, they will be able to say, hey, that's the post-Anthropocene. They might be able to, we might be able to do that within 50 years. So um, yeah, I'm, much like the discussion about when the Anthropocene started, I, I kind of, I'm interested in that discussion, but I kind of think it's irrelevant. <laughs> like, I mean, does it really matter? I mean, it has more to do with the language that we use and the way that we understand the situation that we're in. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, our next uh, questioner uh, will be Peter McKinnon. And I just want to thank uh, Peter, uh, before you start, for all the information that you've been supplying along yeah. the way. Thank you so much. Over to you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rick. And uh, Rosalind, uh, thank you for a fascinating and rather eclectic uh, swath of the gloom and doom. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm very much on your page about to the degree of the gloom and doom that you outlined. So uh, my, my question, despite uh, pointing out, in fact, and maybe I should do that first, uh, and whether you use this as a reference, because the, the UN agency that deals with um, basically catastrophic disaster, mostly dealing with natural disaster, uh, has issued a recent report mm -hmm. that I've sent and posted in the, in the chat. And it's very disturbing because it talks, of course, about scenarios, but the scenario that's gaining traction is the scenario about the collapse of civilization. And I think that this, this report is a very important kind of dialogue that people that typically in the Club of Rome would be very interested in, in discussing. So I put that as a, as, a, as a reference point. And then I asked the, the simple question with the incredibly hard answer, of course, with all this doom and gloom, what is the prognosis? And then what? Since we know what it might be, how are we going to deal with it? Thank you. Yeah. Well, as as humans, as humans, and not just so not just humans in the last um, I don't know if I like the word civilization, because I think there, there have been multiple civilizations throughout human history, but um, the modern world that we think of you know, the technology and the transportation, the cars, the, the houses, that might all be at risk. I think we should maybe recognize that. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that what we're moving to would be going backwards, but that's a decision we have to make. It might be that we can live more sustainably and still be uh, 
and still be and still be concerned about our well-being and have good well-being. What is our prognosis? So that's a medical term. <laughs> um, and I, I ask myself, what is when a doctor is thinking about um, the situation of a disease or a, a, an unease or a lack of well-being for the planet? How would they think about that, and how would they cure it? What would be, or what would be the the potential course of that disease? But this isn't really a disease in that sense, because. It doesn't have a predictable course in the way that we can say it's going to go one way or the other. And even doctors will admit that sometimes their prognosis are wrong. They're just plumb wrong. It's based on what we've seen in the past, what we've experienced in the past, and we are part of that equation. How we live is part of a huge part of that equation. So um, what we can do is we can say business as usual versus what else might happen? Um, the most we can say, I think, is that if we keep smoking, if we don't exercise, if we don't eat right, and we, we have a pretty good idea that we're gonna get sicker. That's business as usual, right? Without making any changes. Um, so as a doctor, I think that's the kind of the best you can do. We can't, keep, we can't keep going with what we're doing. We have to stop digging the hole that we're digging, at, at the very least. <laughs> as far as what else the prognosis might bring, because it depends so much on our own, on our decision making. It, it's uh, very difficult to say. Um, the doctor can say, you have diabetes. Uh, if you don't change your diet, and if you don't start exercising, this is how the disease will progress. That, we have some certainty about and yes you're right it's pretty it's pretty black well we are dealing with law not as you said law uh non-linear complex systems yeah and uh yeah. they're they're very unpredictable in many respects but scenarios do help they at least can yes. guide us and so i was wondering if you might comment about scenarios but that can be for some, not, some, not another question later on i'm going to also yeah. have to leave shortly but unfortunately oh yeah yeah well i think we we use we rely on scenarios we rely on modeling for uh for covid-19 that was the most recent example where we had we had uh, basically on a pretty regular basis like a weekly basis here's the reproduction rate Here's people's behavior. Here's here's the strain we're dealing with. The, the characteristics of the of this hazard, right? Here's the hazard we're dealing with. These are the characteristics of this hazard. Let's plug it in and let's see what the uh, modeling says. But I I think one thing we learned from COVID is that we have to recognize that the modeling can only go so far, and the modeling was sometimes wrong, dead wrong. I'm a political scientist and I can tell you that polls are harder to read now than they were 50 years ago. It's not just modeling, it's everything. You can't tell people's attitudes, you can't tell people's um, the way they're gonna vote. You can't predict elections the way that you used to be able to. We're not in the Holocene anymore. <laughs> so the value of modeling is being eroded. Um, and I think many of us are, are, are scientists and we want to be able to say that our models have some validity, um, but we also have to realize that we need to learn about how modeling is done and what are, the, what are the assumptions and the premises of a certain model before we can really say that this is close to what we might be experiencing. And this is a terribly inadequate answer, I think, but <laughs> it's just sort of the way, sort of the way it is. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you. your question very much, though, and I, I do follow the uh, UN disaster risk reduction uh, reports very carefully, and they're getting more and more urgent. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and thank you, Rosalind. Uh, our next question will come from Anitra Torhaug, uh, followed by Zach Jacobson. Uh, Rosalind, thank you for a very, very enlightening and frightening <laughs> presentation. 
of where we are and where we've come from 42,000 years ago. I think a central question that some of us have been working on in the Club of Rome is if, if we were to gain well-being rather than monetary value increase, which seems to be the objective of most of the world, although much of the world would like well-being, uh, how do we arrive at that? And the, the paradigm change in the mind of both of those in power in the governance and financial systems, as well as the poorest of the poor who are trying to survive around the world, seem to be somewhat overwhelming, although they need to have a paradigm shift to see themselves related to at least the plants that are giving them the oxygen to breathe mm -hmm. and the water, which is giving them the ability to, to live for another 30 days. Do you have suggestions uh, based on experiential things you've seen as to how you most rapidly would make paradigm shifts in governance in mm -hmm. the financial global financial system and for the poorest to the poor i think you've just really hit on the heart of the issue right um, for political science is is how do these systems change do they change from the top down or from the bottom up uh the political scientist in me says uh top down is what matters um, top down is ultimately what leads to systems change but the, the paradox, of course, is that those at the top are the least likely to want to change. Uh, so then it becomes, what's the motivation? Uh, what mo possible motivation there could there go. be <laughs> right, to oh, encourage yeah. those at the top, at the, the, the peak of decision-making, those in the, at the banks and the, um, the, diplom the diplomats? How do we you know, convince them? Uh, I think... This is the problem I've been trying to solve my whole life, but um, science, let, let, let's, I'll, I'll just take the role of science. Science is much more influential than we think. Science, um, advanced, science still, still to this day has a lot of legitimacy in society. People believe scientists more than they believe politicians. They believe scientists more then they believe uh, police forces more than they trust the media, more than they trust even school teachers and educators, more than they trust corporations. They still, despite everything, despite what you hear about, you know, Dr. Fauci and the, the attacks on scientists, people still believe in science. And this is the number one thing I think that is pushing change as much as we've changed as we've seen. I do want to give credit to Greta Thunberg for leading the youth voices on this because uh, the youth also have a lot of legitimacy and a lot of power to move this forward because they're pointing out, which is obvious to everybody, they have the most at stake. Young people have the most at stake. So if I was going to point to two groups in society that I think could have the most influence, it would be scientists, and it would be young people. Thank you, uh, Anitra. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, our next uh, question will be from uh, Zach Jacobson and uh, Jeff Strong, you're on deck. Oh, hello. I, I, I guess I can call myself a scientist, but I can't call myself young. Um, uh, unfortunately, my question is basically the same as Peter's. What the hell can we do? Uh, I know that Peter and I are, are working uh, with others on very much, we're seized with that report um, uh, from, the, uh, from the UN and uh, wanting to know what to do with it. Um, I, it was a wonderful talk you just gave and given. Uh, my only comment, which would be something that Peter um, hinted at but didn't say is um, I, I wish your graphics wouldn't show nuclear waste as a huge boogeyman because 
the only solutions we can see to getting through the next 42 years, much less 42,000 years, involve an awful lot of nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah. that's that's a comment, not a thing. If but if you have, we did have one thought around this table, uh, the, the people that are talking here. Someone gave a a, a a talk on on what societies work, and all of them were the ones that work were small, and they tended to be run by women. And I began <laughs> to think, and not trivially, put women in charge. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's yeah. still a trivial idea. <laughs> um, I think that feminists would say right, right direction, but there has to be more. Like there has to be more accompanying that, and that is um, ch system change. So there, even if we, even if women ran all the international banks and headed up all the governments, I'm not. I'm not saying things wouldn't be, in some ways different um but as long as the systems are still there the the motivation for individuals to fit into the system might end up being too strong for them to be able to make that systemic change so this is something feminists have been arguing for a long time too is that it's not just about adding women and stirring it's about changing the system and the relationships <laughs> that build that system so <laughs> um but you know um what what else can we do i i'm a big i'm a big believer in if you want to change systems then encourage people to listen at some level to each other and consider themselves as part of a system um for example the the uh, convoy movement in canada um or I, I would say one thing that kind of links them together is this, the sense that they they're separate, that they're they're not part of they're not part of this whole, they're not part of the system, and they maybe they want to be, they want to be integrated, they want to be integrated in a situation of power, but as long as we keep forgetting that we're connected, it's going to be hard to do anything. So it's like baseline baseline starting point for all ecology what's the starting point everything is connected and if we don't at some level say yes we recognize the truth of that the real truth of that then i don't think we can move forward at all it's very difficult to move forward at all i don't think everyone's always going to agree with that but at not some not systemic that, level not just everything is connected everything is connected in a complex way so you can't tell what's about to happen when you yeah. do something if you're yeah. not very careful i i want to be okay. fair too i mean my biography kind of touched on the fact that i'm an activist and i do want to say that i am an activist i i work with climate groups locally i see we have one member of our climate group on the call today hi tracy <laughs> and i i work with um I work with uh, organized uh, non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations. I'm on the board of Canadian Environmental Network. I'm an activist on the ground, so I'm I'm talking to, trying to talk to politicians, trying to get people to work together, trying to get um, cross-generational groups to work together. I'm in education, so there's a ton of stuff that I do that if I didn't believe this could make a difference. You know, I wouldn't be there, right? And I'm there. I'm. I'm. I go to the protests. I go to the. I write the policy briefs. I work on the board. I do a lot of. I spend a lot of my time working with young people, and I spend a lot of my time trying to make the argument that uh, this has been a very philosophical discussion. But I do spend a lot of time trying to make the practical arguments that there are things we can do whether that's changing our um, individual lifestyle or whether that's changing our systems and structures. Thank you very much, Rosalind. We're closing in on uh, three o'clock. We've got about nine minutes and uh, we have uh, Jeff Strong on next and uh, Ted, uh, you can uh, get yourself on the screen for the next question. 
Ted Manning. Yes, Rosalind, first I want to compliment you on your uh, good knowledge of environmental, particularly climate scientists. Uh, I know you work with some of them, as you just said, but, but particularly of the risks involved in uh, climate. Now, at some point, and I was just distracted by something, and I saw the end of your slide, you talked about, I don't know, it was adaptive restoration or adaptive management, and I got the impression you were thinking we're leading towards adaptive management. But it's fairly limited to date, if we are. We have governments that still support the fossil fuel industry with subsidies. Our own government is one of the worst. Yeah. Um, and we, of course, we have a fossil fuel industry that's hanging on tenaciously to their sources of uh, income and that, which they don't really need. Um, so do you really believe we're headed towards adaptive management and what do we need to turn the tide? <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, adaptive management is more like the prescription um, as an alternative to the management model that we use now. So I see elements of it. I see aspects of it uh, in the circular economy, in the idea of circular societies. I see it in indigenous governance. I see it in cooperatives. I, I do see it. I do see that that approach to management and and system change and system structures. But I think you're right. It's not the dominant approach. Maybe it shouldn't be the dom ever be <laughs> dominant in that sense because it's dominant kind of goes against the whole idea of that circular uh, management uh, paradigm. Um, so I see it in pockets. I agree with you. It's it's sort of in pockets, but it's. Uh, the fossil fuel industry is, is yes, for me, I've talked about the politics of oil before and how oil is so, why is oil such a problem? Why are fossil fuels such a problem? And it ultimately comes down to, and here I'm going to just sound like an economist, the supply and demand issue. Like, which do you address, supply or demand? Um, and the oil industry, by the way, is very much paying attention to demand. And they're very worried about it. And they're assuming all kinds of things that demand is gonna keep going up, that people are still gonna keep buying oil, that our society is gonna be dependent on them forever. Um, on the supply side, I mean, it will follow from that eventually. Uh, if, we, if we start, let's say we start increasing our urban densities, Let's say we move away from cars. Let's say we start electrifying everything. Let's say we move away from natural gas. Ultimately, the fossil fuel industry cannot ignore that. They can't. They can't stay in business. Yeah, but so, you know, and I, I love, I do, I support the idea of having a greenhouse gas emissions cap for the fossil fuel industry. But the only thing that will do is create more room for the rest of society to release more greenhouse gases. So it comes down to that consumption versus production. Yeah, my argument is that we really need leadership at the government level, and that's where we're not getting it. Uh, you know, we often look to the U.S. for leadership on environmental issues, and that we're not getting it. The U.S. Supreme Court just in the last week or so restricted EPA uh, ability to mandate uh, carbon, uh, you know, carbon emissions, things like that. And it's... Yeah, yeah. Governance, well, that's my main area of study. So totally agree. <laughs> yeah, governments have to step up for sure. Thank you very much, Rosalyn. Thank you, Jeff, for your question. Uh, the next questioner will be Ted Manning, uh, followed by Gordon Kubanek. Uh, if we have time, we've got about uh, four minutes left. Over to you, Ted. Thank you, Rosalyn. I'm a social scientist too, and I was delighted to see a political scientist here. Uh, my question, can we scare them into submission? If we are able to model, scope, or portray the risks effectively, Will they scare into the kinds of actions that all of us would like? Uh, uh, the problem with fear as a motivator is that it's much more unpredictable than other kinds of motivators. <laughs> yeah. Fear, there's three reactions, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. 
Mm-hmm. That's the part of you, the part of your psychology that responds to fear is not the one that produces constructive Mm-hmm. system changing transformations yeah. it's the part of your psychology that produces street fights coups yeah. guerrilla wars um and retreat right people re- can retreat they just get overwhelmed there's this sense of hopelessness i feel so much for i see that so much among young people who are afraid and not knowing what to do. And they do feel frozen because they don't know if they should plan for their future. And well, it's, will not, it's not the best industry thing. industry yeah. help them make that decision? What can help people make the decision is to think about what their, how, that their alternative life could be just as good as the one they have now. Thank you. And, uh, we need to model that. Maybe that's what we need to model. Instead of modeling how COVID-19 is going to spread through a population, <laughs> let's model what happens if we all wear masks? What happens if we all you know, do this? What happens if we all get vaccinated? How does that improve our, our life chances? The key will be to model positive futures and try and convince people they're possible. Yes. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you, Ted. Uh, Gordon, you're on now, and uh, we are down to the last two minutes. Um, if there is time, we'll be able to take a question from Peter Bolkowski, but we'll see. Over to you, Gordon. I'm outside, so you're hearing a motorcycle in the background. I apologize. Um, my quick question is, I read a book recently about the earthquake in Lisbon in 1755, and comment is a, a comment by the guy who helped rebuild Lisbon, Portuguese yeah. guys who said the disaster was basically necessary because the, the status quo powers were entrenched and therefore it was actually the best possible thing that could have happened in the long term. Mm. So it seems to me that it, our, my question is, are we in the same situation where a disaster should not be looked upon as a bad thing but rather as a good thing, because it's the only way we get things to change. Are we at that point? Hmm. Yes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very wary of the narrative that disasters are necessary for change. They can be fulcrums of change. They can be ways of of, of they can be turning points. They can, they can be those change from one system to another. Um, but I'm very wary of thinking of them as as sort of necessary. So I would ba- I would back away from that, and I would I wouldn't support any historical narrative that says if they went along in this particular direction without the disaster, it would have been worse. So, but at the same time, I mean, my story about the caves is kind of indicative. Is that we are. We are, we're adapted to a disaster. We, we are what we are today. The, the, the humans that we are today came about because of climate change, because of disasters, because of these changes in systems. So um, I want to say, no, I want to say, I'm a little bit more positive. These disasters don't have to happen. Let's not think of them as preconditions for change. Let's start now, let's start making those changes. We can think ahead, we can plan ahead. We don't need to wait for the disaster before we start making those changes. I mean, (laughs) fair enough. I mean, I think that's a reasonable point. I guess my point is that rather than seeing a disaster though as a bad thing, seeing it as Mm. part of life, it's part of how nature operates. And it's quite normal in nature to have cataclysms and life goes on and we just adapt. And so not to be fearful of it. It's all, as you said before, the fear is, is you get frozen. And I agree with you. Yeah. I've met most people I know are frozen. Um, yeah. And so just to look at it and say, you know, it's just, it's another thing you just kind of roll with and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that one. Um, so disasters can be creation, can be, Destruction, creation, many religions around the world see them as the same symbol. Um, So um, the problem is we don't see the creative part. 
you know, until the disaster happens. And yeah, let's let's try to imagine the creative part of a disaster. And I yeah, do well, recognize exactly. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> disaster yep. now is that we've arrived at the end of uh, our time for these excellent questions and uh, excellent answers. So uh, thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Rosalind. And uh, to conclude today's presentation, I'd like to now call on the chair of our board of directors for the Canadian Association of the Club of Rome, Jean Doherty. Thank you, uh, Rick, and uh, thank you, Rosalind. That it was wonderful. It is my pleasure and my privilege to have the opportunity to thank you on behalf of KCOR for this absolutely wonderful presentation that you gave today. In my, in my opinion, and this is mine, and I think it's shared by everyone here, you gave a, a, a very good overview of what is a very complicated um, story, and basically the story of where we were, where we are, and what's going to happen in the future. I think it was extremely well done and, and well thought out. So thank you very much for that. I very much appreciate that. And uh, for those of you who are still here or those who listen to this later, this particular talk will be available on our website at CanadianCore.com. You can go to the stay tuned and stay informed section and um, find the new talk topics that have been put up on our network on our YouTube, including this one. So I encourage you to go there, encourage to sign on to become stay informed so that you get all of the new things coming on to our website. Our, our website is the source of a lot of information, a lot of discussion. And if you wish to become involved for with KCOR as part of our discussion groups and so on, I strongly encourage you to go to the website and join the membership and uh, sign in for a membership form and it would be encourage all of you to do that it's just it's a really good opportunity to exchange some pretty good ideas on an in-depth level so thank you very much <laughs>